So, uh, uh, as most of you know, I'm Craig Snyder, the president of the World Affairs Council of Philadelphia. Uh, I begin, as I always do, uh, with a reminder to turn off your cell phones if you haven't yet done so. Um, and uh, my opening remarks uh, are more brief uh, than usual uh, uh, because this is we're coming towards the end of this program season, and so I don't have my customary list of uh, uh, announcements of upcoming programs. But please stay tuned to the website. Uh, and you'll be seeing uh, a, a rich offering for the fall coming soon. And keep uh, tuning in to WHYY for our TV series on the third Sunday uh, of uh, each month at 3 o'clock. Um, I want to introduce now uh, a board member uh, of the council, uh, Mr. Robert Kane, who is regional president of Key Bank, who will uh, deliver some opening remarks for us tonight. Thank you. Well, well, Craig, I have the exact same uh, notes about the uh, cell phones. I guess you guys are really serious about this, okay? Uh, good evening, Bob Kane. I'm the market president for uh, KeyBank. Uh, and, and as Craig said, I'm the director of the World Affairs Council. Uh, while KeyBank has only been in this uh, region for a short period of time with the acquisition of uh, First Niagara Bank, I'm thrilled to say that I've been involved with the World Affairs Council for uh, 15 years. I go back, uh, I think I went back three presidents. Uh, so I've been uh, very involved with it. Uh, the last six months, we've, KeyBank has made our mark here. We were supporting uh, the businesses, we're supporting uh, community partnerships, engaging with organizations like the World Affairs Council, serving our clients, uh, big and small. We're the 13th largest bank in the country. We have uh, 1,200 branches from Portland, Maine to Portland, Oregon. So uh, we're nearing the end of the council uh, program season, so I have some exciting events just to mention to you. On May Monday, May 15th, the council is hosting an event for its Young Professionals Group, uh, the Young Friends of the Council, uh, featuring author uh, Andrew Sullivan, who will talk about how he believes travel can change the world. Uh, then there will be a Quizzo, featuring questions on history, politics, geography, culture, and prizes uh, for uh, the winners. Then on May 30th, which I know I'm coming to this one, uh, finally Memorial Day, the Council will be hosting an, events, uh, an event on the uh, Veterans Affairs, uh, featuring author uh, James Wright uh, about his book, uh, Enduring uh, Vietnam, as well as remarks from veterans from the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, thank you all for being here. I'd like to turn it over to Raza right now, uh, Vice Chairman of the World Affairs Council and Chairman and CEO of uh, Parkway Clinical Labs and uh, the global spokesperson for the North American Point of Contact uh, for General Bashar, uh, former President of Pakistan. Raza? and also for giving me a heads up in, in the men's room that Craig is, uh, is on pin and needles, making sure that everything starts on time. But uh, something that I hope that our distinguished speaker will confirm, you know, from where I come from, we always are just in time. <laughs> we always make sure that everything looks fine while they may be chaos in the back. But I really, really appreciate the opportunity to introduce our speaker. Uh, over these years, uh, I have had the pleasure and privilege to introduce more than few speakers from this podium as a uh, member of the World Affairs Council and through the work of our foundation. Uh, but today, I have the privilege of introducing one of the finest and uh, who I would consider one of the rare diplomats that the world has produced. And it is my pleasure that he actually hails from the same country as my mother in Pakistan. So please join me in welcoming Ambassador Munia Khan, uh, who is with us this evening. <laughs> Ambassador Akram started his uh, diplomatic career in 1967, which is uh, now almost 50 years uh, today. Uh, and has served as a permanent representative of Pakistan to the United Nations from 2002 to 2008. And during his term at the UN, uh, two of his significant contributions were to be the president of the UN Security Council. Before that, Ambassador Akram was 
the uh, permanent representative of Pakistan in Geneva from 95 through 2002. And besides that, I think he has had been traveled across the country carrying the flag of Pakistan and making us all very, very proud. During his uh, distinguished and long tenure, certainly he has made friends and acquaintances across the world uh, uh, amongst world leaders and notables uh, in, in the West, in Europe, in the Middle East, uh, especially in China. And when it comes to making friends with the world leaders, I can personally vouch for as a a North American point of contact for my friend and benefactor, Daniel Musharraf, who also I had the pleasure to introducing on this very podium uh, nearly 10 years ago, uh, that he uh, has close personal association with him. And knowing, knowing Daniel Musharraf, he has, uh, he only perpetually compliments few set of people. And I think there are probably half a dozen of those. And Ambassador Muniakram is on the top of that list. So with that, I welcome and I present to you Ambassador Muni Akram. Thank you. Thank you very much, Raza, for uh, that, that very generous uh, introduction. Uh, and thank you, Greg, for, for inviting me uh, and Mr. Kane for, uh, for having me at this uh, beautiful setting in Philadelphia. Uh, I can uh, say that the view is grand and uh, the company uh, is equally uh, auspicious and, and I hope that we will have a very productive uh, discussion this evening. Uh, I apologize for my voice. My wife told me to speak up, uh, but she stopped me from smoking cigars a few weeks ago and my <laughs> wife voice hasn't really come back. <laughs> uh, Pakistan and the United States are old friends uh, and almost family. And as in the case with family, there is a lot of uh, love and sometimes a lot of hate. And both go together uh, quite often. But the other day when the Prime Minister of Pakistan, Nawaz Sharif, telephoned President Trump to congratulate him on his election, he was told that Pakistan is a fantastic country and that he is a fantastic guy. <laughs> and that we would have very good relations in the, in the future. And that is certainly, I think, the hope of most people in Pakistan, that our two countries will be able to re-establish the close ties that we have enjoyed for so many years in the past, and which have been interrupted uh, at certain moments in recent history. There are many reasons why Pakistan and the United States should be close. The United States is still the world's largest power. If not the sole superpower, it's still the world's most dominant and powerful country. Pakistan, on the other hand, is the sixth largest country by population in the world, with 200 people. It is a country which is the most influential country in the Muslim world. A country with a army which is the fourth largest in the world. It is a nuclear weapon state. It is an economy that is growing at 5% despite all the problems of violence and terrorism and sanctions and everything else that we face. Our average growth has remained 
And today we are again poised in the geographical location which is the center of global economic growth. China, West Asia, South Asia. These are the most dynamic areas of the world today in economic growth terms, and Pakistan sits at the center. So we have great potential, and we believe that that potential can be developed basically with the cooperation and help of the United States and the help and cooperation of China, our two biggest, oldest, and strongest friends of Pakistan. And Pakistan is proud of the fact that we were the ones who brought the United States and China together in 1971. And it is our hope that we will continue to enjoy that privileged relationship with both superpowers in the future. But having said that, we have to see how is it that the Pakistani American relationship will develop in the future. There are many reasons for cooperation, substantive reasons for economic cooperation, for cooperation against terrorism, against non-proliferation. Nevertheless, to be realistic, one has to see that nations act in their own interest. And the United States and Pakistan are no different from other nations and states. Pakistan has invested a lot in the American relationship over, over the years. The United States, however, because it is a superpower, because it is a country with multifarious, multiple interests, has always seen that the Pakistani relationship has been a function of America's larger strategic interests across the world. So sometimes when we had the Cold War relationship, Pakistan was the most allied ally of the United States. We were in the CETO, we were in CENTO, uh, we had a bilateral defense treaty. Uh, we were the most, most close ally of the United States because we were confronting the Soviet Union together in the Cold War. When the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, we collaborated very closely with the United States. But when the Soviet Union collapsed and was no more, and, and the Soviets left Afghanistan, the United States' interest in Pakistan diminished. We became the object of sanctions for our nuclear program. So it has always been a function in Washington to see Pakistan as fitting into a broader mosaic of its interests. And this is, this is quite normal. This is uh, nothing abnormal. This is our state today. So today, my submission is that the Pakistan-US relationship, despite the goodwill and despite the nice telephone call between Mr. Trump and Mr. Nawaz Sharif, this relationship will be determined by the US position with regard to four other countries, not Pakistan. And those four other countries are Afghanistan, India, Iran, and China. U.S. interests with each of these countries have to be evaluated as to what the policies will be and its impact on Pakistan. With regard to Afghanistan, it's a checkered history. I don't, I don't think we need to go into that. But today, what is the situation in Afghanistan? The United States National Security Advisor, when he came to Afghan Kabul and Islamabad two weeks ago, stated that there is a quiet maya, there is a military impasse in Afghanistan because there are 
the Afghan Taliban enjoy safe havens in Pakistan. We in Islamabad strongly disagree with that evaluation, which we think is a handover from the evaluation of the previous administration. And I will explain why. In Afghanistan today, there are 10,000 foreign troops. There is an Afghan army of 180,000 on the books. But in reality, probably half of that, the rest are just on paper. It is a demoralized army, driven by corruption from the top to the bottom. This army is facing a Afghan Taliban force of regular force of 30,000, which can go up to 80,000, depending <coughs> on who joins the fight on any given day of the week. So there are 80,000 motivated, committed Afghan Taliban fighting the Kabul forces and the foreign forces. On top of that, you have three to 5,000 Islamic State forces, which are composed of a whole motley group of terrorists and criminals, Pakistani terrorists, the TTP, the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan, the East Turkmenistan movement, the Chinese Ubus, the Chechens, opposed to the Russians. These are all grouped together in the so-called Islamic State, and more are coming as the United States and, and forces attack ISIS in Syria and Iraq, more of them are escaping. Well, they are escaping all over the place, but they are, some of them are also escaping into Afghanistan, into what they call the Islamic State of Khorasan province. Khorasan is the old name for Afghanistan, Pakistan. This is the configuration in Afghanistan. How do we defeat this configuration? The United States believes that by putting another 10, 5, 10,000 troops that you can fight ISIS and you can fight the Taliban at the same time. We believe that this is militarily not possible. The, Tal the Taliban today, according to a map that was published in Wall Street Journal April yesterday, if you see that map, the government control is constricted in turn into areas near Kabul and Kandahar and Herat. The rest of the country is either Taliban control or Taliban influence. The international community, the United Nations, which includes Russia, China, others, all have come to the conclusion that the only way to bring peace to Afghanistan is a negotiated settlement between the Afghan Taliban and the Kabul regime. This is the international consensus of how peace can be restored. And if we believe that if that is the consensus, we can achieve that if we all work together. So far, Russia, China, Iran, Pakistan, are all on board with the strategy of negotiation in order to, to bring peace between the Kabul and the Afghan Taliban and to fight the ISIS, which should be the real target uh, again of inside Afghanistan and the region is the Islamic State Daesh, which is the real terrorist, global terrorist. The Afghan Taliban are nationalists. They have national objectives. They do not have global objectives. So this is the conversation we're having at the present time with Washington on Afghanistan. With regard to India, the Obama administration had taken the view that India had to be built up as a counterpoint to contain the rise of China. 
and therefore all the doors, technology, arms, nuclear cooperation, all the doors were open to India. And India began to acquire arms. India began to have a, a sense of self-confidence with the backing of the United States to be able to take a very tough line with Pakistan. Refused, refused to talk about Kashmir, refused to talk on arms control, ref, refused to talk on containing the nuclear danger in South Asia. And with the election of Mr. Modi, this hard line right wing ideology became a part of the position of Delhi, which the United States, under the previous administration, did not do very much to change. We believe in Pakistan today that this paradigm is not a sustainable paradigm in South Asia, where India is built up as a major military power, whereas Pakistan's interests are ignored. Because Pakistan, although it's smaller than India, it's a country of 200 million people, and it is able to respond. So we have taken actions in Pakistan to neutralize Indian build up. The Indians moved their forces up, up front. We moved our forces and we deployed short range missiles. And we did annihilate them if they attacked us. The United States, under the previous administration, felt this was destabilizing. Our contention was the destabilization arises from the Indian deployment rather than our counter response to that. We believe that we have an opportunity today to convince the Trump administration to adopt a more balanced position between India and Pakistan. We understand if they wish to build India, that's fine, but they should, not, they should maintain a balance in the relationship vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan so that Pakistan does not feel threatened and is then obliged to take actions which bring the possibility of conflict much closer. Uh, so we, we have a lot of work to do with Washington vis-a-vis -vis the Indian dimension is concerned. The third country is Iran. The Trump administration, unlike the Obama administration, has adopted a, a position that they would want to reverse the gains that the Iranians have made in Iraq, in Syria, in Lebanon, in Yemen, at the cost of the Sunni powers. Iran has emerged as a key player in all these conflicts, and it is pushing its interests ruthlessly. The United States is forming a new alliance. A new alliance which will include on the one side Israel, on the other side Saudi Arabia and the Gulf countries, and to which Pakistan has also been invited. We are of course in a very different position. We are a country with 80% Sunni Muslims, 20% Shia Muslims. If there is a war between or a conflict between Shia Iran and Sunni Saudi Arabia, Pakistan would become the battleground of such a conflict. We have to therefore tread very carefully to see how to manage the relationship between Saudi Arabia and Iran and our own relationship with the Saudis and with the, with the Iranians and through life with the, with the United States. Again, it, it is going to be a challenging task of trying to convince both sides of coming onto the path where they can resolve their problems peacefully rather than escalating the conflict.
conflicts which are already taking place in, in Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, and, and Yemen. This is the third challenge which is going to impact on Pakistan's relationship with the United States. And the last but not least is China. Pakistan has consistently felt that in order, in the ideal situation for us is a cordial and equidistance relationship between, uh, with China and with the United States. That's not always been possible. But China has remained a consistent friend over the years, and we value that. At no point in time, with the, even the change of regimes, change of circumstances, the Chinese have never acted against the interests of Pakistan. And that is, that is a huge element of the mutual trust that exists between Pakistan and China. We want the same kind of relationship with the United States, one of trust. And we believe that having worked China and the US together in the past, we can still play that role. Mr. Trump's early pronouncements on China were disturbing for us because it indicated the possibility of a real confrontation between the US and China. But the subsequent, subsequently, I believe that pragmatism has become more prevalent in Washington's policy towards China. And the cooperation on North Korea may be the start of a wider degree of cooperation between these two superpowers. Uh, which would be very beneficial for, for Pakistan. But it is by no means a final determination. Relationships are still in flux, China and the US. We are not certain where this relationship will end. We hope it will end in a cooperative way because there is so much that China and, uh, and the US can do together. Uh, it is a relationship which has contributed hugely to China's progress to growth in the, in the world economy, uh, and we believe that that would be the right path for the U.S. and China to follow in the future. We are hopeful, but we are also watching very carefully because that will be a major impact on what Pakistan's future will be in the region and Pakistan's relationship with the United States. I'll stop there. I've gone on a bit longer than I am. Thank you. Mr. Bassett, thank you. Um, I want to probe uh, a little more deeply some of the uh, propositions that you've offered. Um, and let me start with the, with the idea that uh, the United States and Pakistan are essentially like a, like a family with both uh, you know, sort of good and bad relations wrapped up into that. Um, one can make that argument, but one, it seems to me, can also very plausibly um, and with, uh, uh, you know, with uh, fidelity to, to the dictionary, um, make the argument that the United States and Pakistan are in fact countries uh, at war with one another. Uh, the United States has conducted unauthorized military actions on Pakistani soil, uh, some of them resulting in civilian casualties. Um, and Pakistan is widely reported uh, to support uh, forces in Afghanistan that have killed American soldiers for 16 years now. Uh, so again, by sort of conventional definition, one can argue that these two countries have been in a kind of a war with one another while planning an alliance. Uh, for people who take that view, uh, sort of a dim view of the relationship, to say the least, how do you respond? First of all, one has to see what is the reality on these assumptions. Um, as far as 
the U.S. strikes uh, on Pakistan are concerned, as far as the drone strikes are concerned, I had my doubts as to whether these were totally unilateral. Uh, because the drone strikes could not have taken place against targets without information from the, from the ground. And that information would only be provided by Pakistani intelligence. Pakistani intelligence has, has been instrumental in this decimating Al-Qaeda. 1,200 Al-Qaeda have been captured or killed because of Pakistani ISI cooperation with the United States. So I think the assumptions always that we are working against each other, uh, quite often me media, media projections of certain facts. Um, after that, was it in Iraq? I don't know. Uh, was it, com uh, was Pakistan complicit or, or was it incompetent? Um, uh, I think there are many permutations. The fact that these events did not, did not, these events, even the attack on Salala, where 30 Pakistani soldiers were killed by helicopter raid, uh, US helicopter raids, the fact that this did not lead to a war is an indication of the closeness of the relationship. Because I can assure you that if the Indians had done that to us, we would have bombed the hell out of them. Uh, so it didn't happen. And we have come back to a, a working relationship. So that shows the depth of, of, of the of the As far as, as, far as uh, Pakistan supporting uh, Fan Taliban who've been shooting at the, uh, the Americans know that. They, they talk about the Haqqanis, oh, we killed the Haqqanis, captured the Haqqanis, but they come, the CIA comes to Pakistan and says, can you send this message to the Haqqanis, please? Uh, we, we don't want this, we wouldn't want that. So the, the relationship is much more complex. It is deep uh, in terms of the intelligence cooperation. We can, for public consumption, we can abuse each other sometimes. Uh, and uh, may you know be very lovey dovey at, at other times. These are functions of the two democracies that are happening, the requirements of the two militaries that are happening. But what, given all of that, I mean, there are problems. Uh, the US assessment in Afghanistan, in our view, is completely wrong, and I th we think the US has made strategic mistake after mistake in Afghanistan. The first mistake being to try and take out the Taliban. When Osama bin Laden was to be taken out, it could have been done with a special military operation in which we would have cooperated to take out Osama bin Laden. We tried to do that before 9-11. I was personally involved in trying to get Mullah Omar to, to release uh, uh, OBL. Uh, or to give him to the Saudis, I mean, for the Saudi for the intelligence chief, to Mullah Omar. And he refused because he had given him you know, hospitality. But this is the Pashtun way. So I think the Americans know what, where the contacts are. They have not always said to us, have no contact. They know. When they, they want to talk with the Talib, the Kabul and and uh, uh, some requested us to arrange the talks, and we did. And then they were scuttled, of course. So I think it's a, it's a much much deeper deeper relationship. Um, it's a question of evaluating what is the reality of Iran, and we think the American military has been wrong, and we are not shy to say it. And we've said it to Mr. McMaster when he was in a summer of us. Then your evaluation is wrong. You're not going to be able to change the situation in Afghanistan with 5,000 more troops or 10,000 more troops. You had 180,000 foreign troops in Afghanistan. You didn't succeed. With 10,000 more, 20,000, you think you can change the situation? It's not going to happen. So you have to find a political solution. Our target is Daesh. Our target 
for the whole world is Daesh because Daesh is the one that is is threatening us, threatening you, threatening the Russians, threatening us, threatening everybody. So we have to take it. We have to focus on what is the chief of it. Afghan Taliban, yes, they'll fight for their own country, they'll fight for power inside their own country, they will fight foreign forces if they happen to be there. But they are fighting for their own country. And we can make peace with them. Uh, we are convinced we can make peace with them. But we have to bring Washington as well. You uh, anticipate the follow-up question, and I'm sure you've been asked it uh, a million times. But what's your take uh, on uh, the Osama bin Laden issue? Uh, complicit or incompetent? <laughs> Bit of both, I guess. Um, look, I, I think if you see if you see the situation in Pakistan or Afghanistan, and you list the number of militant groups that are running around the whole place. There are all stripes. There is the Al-Qaeda types. There are the local Sunni groups. There are, they are the Afghan groups. They are the pro-Kashmiri groups. All of them are not equal in the sense of being under the same kind of scrutiny by our intelligence. The pro-Kashmiri groups have a one leeway because they are anti-Indian and we think that their struggle against the Indians because the Indians are oppressing the Kashmiris, uh, major 700,000 troops in Kashmir, oppressing the Kashmiris every day. We think that their struggle is legitimate. The Indians have managed to get the United Nations to say, no, these are, these are bad guys, these are our uh, But in the eyes of the Pakistani public, they're not. So who hides with them? It's possible that they can find a cover to somebody like Osama bin Laden to, give, to hide it from our other groups or intelligence agencies. So it can be that. It can, it's also incompetent. Incompetence because we should know where it was. It is in, in our homeland. It's, it's a big country, but we, 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 should, we should know uh, that he was, he was there. But there's another level. What would we do if we got hold of Osama bin Laden? If we kill him, we will have an uprising. If we capture him, do we give him to the United States? We have another problem. Uh, so there are layers of complexity which, which where you have, you have to deal with Osama bin Laden and, and, and his ilk as such. The fact of the matter is that we help to decimate is finished. Al Qaeda central is gone. You know, Zawahiri may be around somewhere, hiding somewhere, but it is not operational. Operational now is Daesh and AQIP in uh, the Arabian Peninsula. They are operational. As such. So we have to see who is operational, what to, what, to, what to focus on, and when to focus on what, uh, on who. So our approach is very practical. We want to deal with the problem, and we don't deal with labels uh, as such. And, and there are complexities that, that we have to address. We turn back to, uh, to India and the U.S.-Indian relationship. So uh, there are projections. There's a study I just read from uh, Price Waterhouse that says that by the middle of the century, uh, India will have the second largest economy in the world. Um, is it not a natural thing for the United States to view India as the primary counterweight to China, as we once viewed China as a counterweight to the Soviet Union? Um, and for Pakistan to uh, insist on opposing that kind of US-Indian relation, is that a realistic prospect as the world develops over the next decade? Well, I think because Let's go down the layer of assumptions. Uh, 
first assumption that it is legitimate or that it is necessary or required for the United States to build India to contain China. Do you want to contain China? Why do you want to contain China? Is China sitting on your borders? Is China aggressing against the United States? Uh, what is China doing to the United States nationally that evokes the response of trying to contain China? China says, well, I have a natural area. I'm the Middle Kingdom. All these countries in the South, they were vassal states. These were my uh, historical states. The United States has the Monroe Doctrine. Uh, we don't challenge the Monroe Doctrine. Why does the United States come and challenge us on this? So the first presumption, does the United States have to confront China? Our view is not. The, the potential for cooperation between China and the United States is so huge and it's so prone. The fact that it is mutually beneficial. You know, one can argue about trade is fair, not fair, etc. And one can, one can do that. But in terms of just the interlocking of the two economies, is the potential so huge? Now, does the United States want to throw away that potential by saying, no, actually, I'm going to promote India to, to confront um, China? And what are the implications of, of that? So that's one assumption. The second assumption that the United States has got the right to arm and, and bolster India without regard to the cost for Pakistan. This presumption, maybe so in Washington, they may say we don't care about. Pakistan, you know, because we we want to arm these guys because our larger interest is to confront the Chinese. So, but then, don't object when Pakistan responds, which we will. We have a problem with India. It is a thousand years of enmity. It is not yesterday. We have a religious problem. We have a thousand years of history where we ruled India. And they resent it. They, there is a resentment, legitimate. Uh, and there, there is the real rationale for the problem. They are, they are occupying a region called Kashmir, which is supposed to be part of Pakistan, which the people want to be part of Pakistan. Every day of the week, they get up and, and, and if you follow social media, they want to be part of Pakistan, and the Indian army is half a million troops there. The most intense occupation in the world, repressing them. And the United States says nothing, because despite its morality, when it comes to Syria, you bomb the Syrian regime because they use chemical weapons, but they kill. Indians can kill the children and shoot them with pellets, and not a pig comes out of Washington. So we have a right when it comes to our national interest that if the United States is army, our enemy, we will respond. And then for the United States then to turn around to us and say, no, you, your response is destabilizing South Asia. Hello? Destabilizing? We are not destabilizing. We are responding. When the Indians move their troops, to our border, it's called a doctrine called cold start. Cold start says within 24 hours, 48 hours, India should be able to respond to a provocation from Pakistan, a terrorist attack, and we should be able to respond and attack the Pakistani army. And they have moved their strike forces up close to the border, whereas previously they were 200 kilometers behind. It's, the doctrine is called cold start. We do not have the forces. We have a large army, but the border is almost 2,000 kilometers. So we, we cannot defend everywhere. So our response is OK. 
you want to bring your forces on? We will multiply our missiles, our short-range missiles, and we will put thousands of missiles on our border, so wherever you attack from, we will annihilate you. This is a res response of self-defense. We made no bones about it. We said, somebody attacks us, we will respond. So I think the assumptions on the basis of which the, the differences have arisen between Washington and Pakistan during the Obama years, these are assumptions, we challenge those assumptions. And I think until we are able to have an honest conversation about the reality, of the legitimacy of these assumptions, we will, have, we will have a problem as such. We believe that there is a new opportunity, at least in, in some of the people that have come in the new administration, these are professional people, masters, matters. These are people we've dealt with before. They know the Pakistani army. We know them very well. And we believe that they are professionals. And they, that there should be some basis of understanding that we are not, we do not want to destabilize the region. We do not want a nuclear war with India. But we, we will defend ourselves. Uh, and we will defend ourselves vigorously. Uh, as, as that is our duty. And we have, have to do that. So, yeah, if I, I'm. No, no. Last, last question for me, and we'll go to questions from the audience. Um, you mentioned uh, Iran as another of the key countries. Um, just the other day, there were threats uh, out of Tehran uh, to Pakistan uh, claiming that there are incursions uh, on Iranian territory by Sunni groups uh, with safe haven in Pakistan. So that relationship clearly is, uh, is heating up. Uh, how do you see uh, it developing? It's a, it's a, it's a very disturbing development, uh, as I see it, because we already have a problem with Afghanistan. We have a problem with the Indians. The Iranians, as you know, not the easiest people to deal with. They, it is an old <coughs> civilization, a very proud people, and a country which is mostly Persian, but with parts of it which are minorities, like the Balochistan, Sistan province next to Pakistani Balochistan. It's a Sunni majority area. Khuzistan is Arab majority. There are Kurds in the north, the Armenians, there are Azerbaijani minorities that they have. So Iran is very sensitive to any attempt at destabilizing the country. There have been attempts to destabilize Iran. And the territory of Pakistan, Balochistan, has been used by foreign agencies to interfere in Iran. We acknowledge that. We've tried to control it. It is not always 100% possible to control it. And we have advised the Iranians to understand our limitations of fighting not only these, these Sunni extremist movements, also fighting Indian-sponsored terrorists coming from Afghanistan, with the TTP coming from the north from Afghanistan. And we have multiple militancies we are dealing with, and that they should understand that at times there are incidents like this, but which do not require the kind of hostile response which they have given to us. Nevertheless, they know and we know that if they did what they threatened of coming across the border, we will respond very strongly. We, we will not, because for us, it is, a, it is a matter because if we allow Iran to do this, or we allow Afghanistan to do this, 
it is the Indians who will do it next. And we will never allow, we do not ever want to give the Indians the impression that if they cross the border, that they will not respond. We will respond. And therefore, it's important. If the Iranians cross, we blame them. Uh, and and we, we did that once before. Uh, we did that during the, during the 1980s when the Iran-Iraq war was taking place. And the Iranians sent a special commander force and they destroyed a safe house of a dissident movement in Karachi. They came and rocketed it. And we threatened them uh, that we will, we will come back and do the same to you. And since then, they, they've never, never, never done it. So it's, it's a hard neighborhood. Uh, as, and we obviously have to live in that neighborhood. And we can't live as, as someone who is willing to be punched or not. I just returned from a trip to Vietnam, and um, it was a Vietnamese expression that, that translates, uh, you can choose your friends, but you can't choose your neighbors. Um, it seems uh, that applies to, uh, to the, the central tenets of Pakistani foreign policy. Um, we have a microphone over here, if anybody has one over here, uh, for anybody who would like to uh, come up and ask a question. Please. What avenues of peace, or don't you see any peace, or friendship do you see between Pakistan and India, and also parallel to that, between the Sunnis and the Shias? That's an easy one. <laughs> We have, we have repeatedly proposed a dialogue to them. We have an agreed agenda for a dialogue, uh, which includes Kashmir, peace and security, and arms control, uh, or several other border issues that we, that we have, Sia chain, et cetera. Um, this, the Indians have, for the past two years, refused to talk to us. Uh, they say, unless all violence and terrorism stops, we will not talk to you. Um, we say, well, what's, if all violence and terrorism stop, what's the point of talking? Um, so we say, you know, violence arises from the fact that you are repressing the Kashmiris, and the Kashmiris, there's a militant, militant response to that uh, from our side. So stop the repression of the Kashmiris. And they say, oh, there's no Kashmiris. Uh, is part of our country. We can do whatever we want. Uh, just don't talk about it. So we are in an impasse because they won't refuse to talk, because they feel they're strong. They have the backing of the US and other powers. Uh, they don't need to talk to Pakistan. They feel that they can isolate Pakistan diplomatically sanctions and pressure on Pakistan through the United States and other countries. Um, and therefore, we will come to our senses sooner or later. I, I think they'll have a long wait. Um, sorry, about the Sunni Shia, um, yeah, that's, it's a huge problem. It's a, it's a societal problem. Uh, we, all we can do is insulate ourselves from the, from the Saudi Iranian fight and try and to be impartial so that our people do not become involved in that fight. And some of them are. Please. Um, Mr. Ambassador, as you know, there is concern in some circles in the United States about the relationship between elements of the Pakistani government. In particular, you referred to the ISI, the Inter-Services Intelligence Agency. And I wondered if you could react to an article that appeared in the Washington Post on May 8th, in which they quote uh, Mr. Rabatullah Nabil, former head of Afghanistan's intelligence service, which he said in the Facebook post that Pakistan's diplomatic outreach had a quote, hidden agenda, and that its security establishment wants to soften the new US uh, policy while continuing to support the Taliban by pretending to show that they are willing to work with Afghan's government. This is a time-honored, according to uh, Mr. Novel, a time-honored Pakistani tactic. 
Um, you know, uh, to, I, I'll be very, very brutally frank. Uh, this gentleman from uh, the, uh, from Afghanistan or Afghanistan intelligence, I think one has to go to Afghanistan, one has to go and see who these people are uh, who are in power in Kabul. These are expatriate, it's an expatriate government, to be very frank. These people have no roots in, in Afghanistan itself. These, these people, they are small tribes. The, the real power in Afghanistan are the, mil, are the Tajik, Ahmad Shah Masood's people, Abdullah. These are people with, with the Tajik power. There is, in the, on the Pashtuns, Pashtun side, the number of warlords and the Taliban. In Herat, is Ismail Shah. In the, Turk, in the Turkmenistan region is Dostan, vice president, and the criminal uh, who everybody knows uh, what he did to, the, to his rival the other day. These are the real power in Afghanistan. The people sitting in Kabul are expatriates brought in to rule the country in the, and have been installed by the United States. These people have no roots inside. Afghanistan. Today, if the U.S. forces were out, they would, the Afghan army would collapse, and these people would not be able to survive for more than two weeks. So, and these people make statements in Washington, and are given, you know, press by Washington Post. These are criticizing ISI. ISI, without ISI, Al Qaeda would still be there. Without the Pakistani army, we have. 200,000 troops on the border with Afghanistan. We want to seal the border. Afghans say, no, don't seal the border. Why? Why? Why don't they want to seal the border? Because the TTP is on the Afghan side, and this same gentleman, this, the Afghan intelligence, they are sponsoring with the Indians. Sponsoring these people is sending all the cost to attack our border posts, attack our army positions. So they are the same people. Now, the United States may want, may feel that by putting pressure on us through these statements and through this DTP, that they can get us to cooperate on pushing the Afghan Taliban or attacking the Afghan Taliban. We think it is a wrong position. Even if we, if we attack the Afghan Taliban, they'll be fighting it with us. So we'll have a fight with the Afghan Taliban, with the TTP, the Pakistani Taliban, and Daesh. We're not going to do that. The Afghan Taliban is not attacking us. We're not going to attack them. If, <coughs> if somebody says they are friends, they're being used by Pakistan, so be it. We are not using them. But we're not going to attack them either, because they are not attacking us. They're not our enemies. They're not attacking us. We are attacking people who are attacking us. That's the nature of warfare. We don't attack people who don't who are not fighting you. Why should we? So I think these are these statements that come from partisan sources which do not reflect the Pakistani position. Because it is not in the interest of people sitting in Washington to reflect the Pakistani, real Pakistani position and the real position on the ground. I show you. Do, do have a look at the map in the Wall Street Journal about the control in Afghanistan. It shows the green areas and shows a whole bunch of red and pink areas which is controlled. It's not my map, it's not our map. It's prepared by Wall Street Journal on the basis of, of, of objective analysis. The, sh the power of the government forces, Kabul, is shrinking. The army is collapsing. The Taliban are on the rise. Maybe more troops from here will stop, stop them for a while, but they will not defeat them. We are saying, let's be realistic. We have to negotiate a political settlement. That's the only way we bring peace to Afghanistan. But if people want to pressurize Pakistan and say, no, we will brand you as a terrorist state unless you fight the Afghan Taliban. We never do it. We have two people waiting. These will be the, the last questions. Please, everyone. 
Uh, what is your perspective and what's the perspective of the Pakistani government on the, uh, the debate over Islamophobia in the Western world, but the U.S. more specifically, which has become a big issue recently? Uh, I think, I think the, the whole issue of Islamophobia has, has been in, in debate for over 20 years now. Um, just, just like anti-Semitism, I, I think the, the manifestations have been around for, for, for 20 years uh, in Europe, that's where you remember the cartoons and all of that. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's obviously something that is, uh, that is horrendous and, and damnable and condemnable uh, as, a, as a phenomenon, uh, showing a lack of, to lack of tolerance, uh, but to be very frank, it is not the highest priority in terms of the global problems that we are facing today in the world. And these are, these are geopolitical, geosecurity, and geoeconomic problems that, that we need to address. Please. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, my question is, uh, in regards to earlier, you were saying that it, it would be great if the United States and Pakistan could have a relationship based on trust. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, I'm just thinking of A.Q. Khan, who uh, is the venerated father of Pakistani nuclear power. And my, I guess my question is, uh, Mr. Khan was accused of kind of set and selling nuclear weapons to sworn enemies of the United States. Um, but he's, the, he's, you know, almost like a George Washington, I, I assume, to, to Pakistanis. So how do you square, how, how can you convince the United States you can trust us and yet venerate this, if you're a Pakistani person, this father of of, uh, of your country. Well, well you know, Ekim Khan is a hero uh, in Pakistan because I think without him we would not have been able to produce uh, the fissile material required to build our nuclear weapons. So nationally, whatever else he's done, nationally his contribution to our security is fully recognized. Because without nuclear weapons today, Pakistan would have been aggressed upon many times over. So his contribution to the acquisition of nuclear weapons, which is the ultimate protection that we have today, that is fully recognized and we cannot discount it regardless of it. As, as regards what he did, yes, we, we were surprised, we condemned. Um, he did it without the knowledge of the leadership, so sensibly. So we can we have we can condemn somebody, but still recognize his contribution. But you know, further proliferation or what he did, if you find it to sell weapons to not not sell weapons, he sold centrifuges uh, to the Iranians and. To the, to the Libyans. Um, many have done it in the past. Otherwise, there would have been only one nuclear power in the world, the United States, uh, which originally had the bomb. But the secrets of the nuclear weapons were passed on to other countries by proliferators. It wasn't by magic. Somebody passed on this information to the Russians, to the Chinese, to the, to the Indians, to everybody else. So they have proliferation is, is part of the history of, of the nuclear age as such. And, and, and Ikuhan was part of that. And he did it maybe for money, whatever ideological he did it. But I'll tell you one thing. The centrifuges which he sold the Iranians, and this I have personal knowledge, uh, the centrifuges which he sold the Iranians didn't work. Uh, and, and the ones that he sold, the Libyans didn't even come out of the crate. 
Uh, they still, they were still in the fight. So the Libyans didn't know what to do with them. Uh, so I think uh, one can one can condemn him, but one doesn't need to exaggerate the impact this this had. The question of, of trust, U.S. Pakistan trust. You know, if we began to trot out all the instances where we have lied to each other. It's, it's, we could write a big book uh, <laughs> and, and, and so on. You know, so, you know, we, we accept it, you know, okay, sometimes we lie, sometimes we lie. This is part of the statecraft. Uh, and we have to go and move on and move on and, and establish a relationship. We cannot keep on harping the fact, well, you lied to us, and therefore we're going to punish you. What for? Uh, where, where would it get us? Uh, from here to the, to the, the next day, we have to look after our mutual interests and see how we can promote our mutual interests through cooperation where we can cooperate. Where we cannot cooperate, I mean, the U.S. can say no. We don't want a peaceful solution in in Afghanistan. We want this Kabul regime to stay. We know we've installed them. We're going to make them stay, and we'll put in the military to make them stay because we don't want the Chinese or the Russians or or Iranians or anybody coming in Kabul. We want to stay there. We want to be the sole, sole uh, power in Afghanistan. Okay. If that's the situation, fine. This is national policy. We don't think it's a good policy, but the U.S. may decide to do that. Uh, as a, so I think we, in, in, in state to state relations, we need to get away from moralizing to each other. Uh, we have to accept that our interest, we would act in our interest, the United States would act in its interest, and when their interests are aligned, we cooperate. When their interests are not aligned, we will not cooperate. And hopefully, at least, we will not harm each other, but we will cooperate when it's possible. And that is the nature of the state relations across the board. It's not only in the uh, Pakistan, U.S. Across, across the board, we have a, we have the only thing that we have is because it's a long relationship. We have so, so many so many people are emotionally committed, you know, that we have friends say, oh, we, you know, we, how can we trust you? Uh, but when if you look at it objectively and you see that this is, we have to act in our mutual interest. Find the mutual interest, find the common ground where we can cooperate. Where we cannot find it, let's live and let live. That, I think, is the best policy that we can, we can follow. You know, in the old days, once uh, we were, uh, our F 16s were blocked, we paid for them. Talk about trust. Uh, we paid for 72 F 16s. They were standing somewhere in Texas or somewhere. They said, sorry, we can't give it to you. We put sanctions on Pakistan for nuclear proliferation. We can't give you those, those aircraft. They were be paid for it. It doesn't matter. <laughs> give us some money back. No, we can't get you money back. Uh, so, you know, there's, there are many, many stories that one can come up with and say, well, we resent this or we resent that. But that's history. That's what has happened. We accepted it. We solved it. We solved it. We have to look to the future. And what I try to do is to try and identify where I see are the pressure points on our relationship. Where are the possible differences, and where are the possibilities of building, building alignments and bridges, and at least coming to an understanding of what we can do together. Uh, we think there's great hope. There's no reason for U.S. to confront China. There is no reason for the United States to build India into a major power and destabilize the whole region of Pakistan and dominate the region. Why? There is no reason for the United States to have a war with Iran and sponsor the Saudis to fight, fight the Shia Sunni fight in, in our part of the world. There is no reason we can't find a political solution in Afghanistan. I think it's eminently possible. We can do it, but one has 
America has to give up the pride of being there for 15 years. You know, when, uh, when Alexander was stuck for three years, and he conquered, he conquered Mesopotamia and Persia in one year, and then got stuck in Afghanistan for three years. His mother sent him a letter, <laughs> taunting him. She said, what's wrong with you? You conquered one year, you conquered Persia. In three years, you're stuck in Afghanistan. So according to legend, Alexander sent back a bag of Afghan earth to his mother and said, spread it on your courtyard. So she spread it on the courtyard. And when her nobles started crossing the courtyard, they started fighting and bickering <laughs> with each other. Yes. This is Afghanistan. Uh, and we have to deal with the reality of Afghanistan, not what we want it to be, but what it is. Mr. Bashar, I want to thank you. Uh, I think you've given us a master class in statecraft and.